The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to today's webinar. We're very happy you could join us. My name is Brianna Humphreys and I am the Marketing Manager for K-12 Education Products here at Brooks Publishing. Before we get started today, I'd just like to go over a few housekeeping items. You will be muted for the webinar, uh, but if you have any questions during the pre presentation, please type them into the question box. We'll take these questions after the presentation during the Q&A portion of today's webinar. For the presentation, you might want to minimize the GoToWebinar bar on your monitor so you can see more of your screen. You can do that by clicking um, the orange button with the arrow in the top corner of the control bar. If you need to enlarge the bar again to ask a question, you can just click the orange button again. If you experience any audio issues at any point, you can switch to phone by clicking in the audio section of the webinar panel and using the dial-in information provided. Also, just a quick housekeeping note, we are recording today's webinar, so everyone who registered for this event will receive a link to the recording in a follow-up email tomorrow. During today's presentation, Dr. Paul will be referencing content from her book, Let's Talk, Navigating Communication Services and Supports for Your Young Child with Autism. This is a friendly and accessible guidebook developed for parents of young children with autism and covers everything from autism fundamentals to the specifics of developing an individualized treatment plan for children birth to five. With a research-based knowledge and real-world guidance in these pages, parents will become well-informed advocates ready to provide the best support for their child on the spectrum. I'm very happy to announce that during today's webinar, Brooks will be giving away three free copies of Let's Talk. Winners will be randomly selected from today's live attendees and notified by email after the webinar. Be sure to submit your questions um, ahead of the Q&A portion to increase your chances. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Rhea Paul. Um, Dr. Paul is a professor and founding director of the Speech Language Pathology Graduate Program at Sacred Heart University in Fairfield, Connecticut, an affiliate at Haskins Laboratories and Professor Emerita at Southern Connecticut State University. She is the author of more than 100 refereed journal articles, 50 book chapters, and 10 books, including Let's Talk, Navigating Communication Services and Supports for Your Young Child with Autism. Along with co-author and colleague, Donia Fahim, she hosts the podcast, Let's Talk About Super Special Kids and Cake, on iTunes and Spotify, aimed at supporting parents of children with disabilities. So without further ado, Dr. Paul, thank you so much for being here with us today. Well, thank you, Brianna, and I want to thank Brooks for the opportunity to talk to all of you today, and to thank all of you for taking time out of what I know is a very busy and topsy-turvy period in our lives, uh, and it's really a pleasure for me to have the opportunity to talk with some colleagues about some things I've been thinking about in light of this quarantine. Um, we all know when we work with young children with disabilities, it's very hard to help parents uh, manage their own feelings and issues as well as participate in the education of their children. But now we can't talk to parents directly anymore and we have to find uh, ways to communicate with them remotely. Uh, and so I've been thinking about this a bit uh, over the last month or so, doing a little bit of literature research and trying to come up with uh, some tips that I found in the literature that might be helpful to you in making this transition to remote communication with parents. Um, so um, these are my disclosures. Um, I do receive royalties from Brooks as well as Elsifer, Wiley, Plural, and ProEd publishers. Um, and um, during the course, what I'd like to talk about is how we can function as counselors for parents using these remote strategies. Um, as well as some of the characteristics of adult learners and ways in which we can focus more specifically on parents as the objects of our intervention uh, rather than doing so with children. And then to look a little bit at the literature on how effective this kind of remote counseling and um, parent training has appeared to be. So I want to go back to uh, a, a pioneer in the field of speech language pathology and audiology, that's Dave Luterman, who probably as early as the 1970s um, helped us to realize how important it is that we work with our clients and their families in a counseling role as well as a direct interventionist role. Because people can't 
take in what you're trying to teach them unless they have the emotional background, the emotional basis uh, on which they can stand new learning. So it's really important to understand that being a counselor, although we're not a psychotherapist, um, but being a counselor, someone who listens and clarifies is a very important part of our role. So um, Andrews, uh, in a recent chapter, identified some tools that are used in counseling that have applications to speech language pathology. And the tools that he uh, recommended are unconditional positive regard, active listening, silence, open-ended and solution focused, and summarizing. And I'll just say a few words about each of these to help you think about how you might use them in your work with parents. Unconditional positive regard is something we've all heard about. Uh, we all know we should have it, but it's sometimes very hard to maintain. So if you're working with a parent, let's say, who has a nonverbal child and you think, it, think it's very important to start some augmentative or alternative communication with that child, but the parent insists, no, I want him to talk, sometimes it's hard to maintain an unconditional positive response to this kind of parent. What I would suggest is that you uh, do what I always try to do when I work with two-year-olds, which is to make a deal. Um, if a parent can't buy into your point of view on the issue, listening and supporting the parent and providing an, an alternative that's maybe halfway in between the two of you can sometimes make it easier for the parent to try something they might not be so inclined to try. But the, the unconditional positive regard about it is that we always want to portray a stance of acceptance. We're not there to tell the parent whether they're right or wrong. We're only there to tell them what our position is and why it's that way. But at the same time, we want to understand that the parent always has the child's welfare in the forefront of their mind. And that's what we need to focus on, helping the parent reconcile their notion of the child's best interests with the kinds of suggestions or interventions we might be interested in implementing. So just having a check on yourself as you're talking to parents and always wanting to portray a positive attitude by complimenting the parent, by recognizing what the parent says, by endorsing what the parent says and then adding to it with our own point of view. That maintenance of a positive regard is what's going to help the parent feel that we are an ally and not an enemy. Um, active listening is another important piece of counseling. Active listening simply means listening and then instead of responding to what the client says, reshaping or reforming what they said so that they know we heard them they know that we are listening and we can move on from there with whatever suggestions we might have. So if a parent set, uh, complains about a child not being able to sleep and we want to work with them on developing some sleep skills, before getting to that, we want to say something like, wow, that's really hard. You said he doesn't sleep for more than two hours at a time. Two hours at a time is a really short period of time. I heard you say that he wakes up every single night. So that kind of telling the parent that you heard them and moving on from there. Another important element of counseling is being tolerant of silence. Sometimes it makes sense just to wait and see what the parent will say. Sometimes ask the parent a question and if they don't answer right away, our tendency is to jump in and either give the answer or move on to the next topic. But we want to cultivate the ability to be patient with the silence, to be comfortable with the silence, because a lot of people take time to formulate their thoughts. Not everybody's as talky as us SLPs are. And sometimes people really need time to figure out how they feel and what they want to say. An important part of counseling is to maintain that silence for long enough so that the parent has time to formulate a thought. 
Um, Open-ended and solution-focused questions are an important aspect of counseling. I do have a couple of examples of these. Um, so uh, open-ended questions would be something like, rather than saying, do you ever play with him, which implies that maybe you don't, saying something like, what does he enjoy doing when you do play with him, which assumes that you play with the child and now you're trying to get more information about it. Or a question like, what book does he like best, might put the parent on the spot if the, they don't know about any book the child likes best or they don't think he likes any books. Instead, you might say something like, you said you noticed he doesn't seem to retain what he reads, but he brought a book to school about a basketball player and seemed very interested in that. How does he tell you about books when he reads something that really interests him? So more open-ended, more um, and, and less possible to misinterpret as a judgment. Um, Solution-focused questions would, are questions that um, zero in on not what's going on, but what we can do about it. So a question like, how did you manage to have a fluent conversation with so-and-so the other day, rather than what did you do wrong or what strategies did you use, but what worked for you? Or to a parent, that's a great idea. How did you think that? So trying to support them and also get behind what they're thinking of so that we can tap into some of the processes that went into making the decisions that they made. Or when talking to a teacher, he did it. How did you help him accomplish that? So rather than focusing on what the child did do or didn't do, focus on the successes and get the individual to talk more about them to provide more information. Um, and I just want to go back to one additional tool of counseling that's very important, and that's summarizing. Giving the family a, a synopsis once a conversation is over that concerns not only the action items, what we're going to do, but what the concerns and feelings are that were raised in the discussion. This gives parents the, the uh, impression that we really listen to them, we care about their response and their feelings, and we're ready to work with them to move forward to help the child. Um, so those are just some very basic uh, counseling strategies. I wanted to move on now to talk a little bit about this issue of working with adult learners. When I was doing some research on this, I learned a new word, which is andragogy. I think that's how it's pronounced. Andragogy means teaching adults. Uh, and there is actually a whole literature on this, how we teach adults. But um, I tried to pull out some kind of uh, big take home messages and some very basic strategies that work, that research has shown us work when working with adults are first of all, always making the content relevant. So we don't wanna talk about children with autism in general. We wanna talk about your child with autism and what this child needs, not what some general population needs. We always want to encourage the parent to participate, to say something, to do something, to try something, so that we're not just talking at them like I'm talking at you right now. <laughs> uh, we want to explain the benefits of what we're trying to do, not tell them, oh, I'm going to work with, uh, uh, with the child on getting his tongue behind his teeth, but I'm going to work with the child on how to make his tongue do what it takes to say these sounds, because if he puts his tongue in the right place, the sound will come out right. Um, you want to allow debate. Adults have their own opinions, and they're not going to take what you take what you say as gospel. Uh, so you want to make sure they have that opportunity to disagree and argue, and that you're not trying to persuade them or win them over. You're trying to listen and see how their perspective influences what is going to be best for this child. And you want to make it clear that you value their experience. They have tons more experience with the, with the child than you do, but they may also have other kinds of experience that is very relevant and could be very helpful. And you want to just tell them that you value that uh, when they present it to you. Wow, that's a really interesting way of looking at it. I never thought about it that way before. That never happened to me. Tell me more about it those kinds of comments. And in doing so, the aims uh, that we want to attain by these kinds of strategies are to actively involve the parents. So we always want to get them to do something while they're with us. Not go home and do it, but let's try it now. Let's see how it works, applying it immediately. Um, we want them to be self-directed. So we don't want them to depend on us 
to tell them what the next step is. We want to give them a general outline, a general strategy that they can modify to their own circumstances. Um, we always want to be task oriented when we're teaching adults. That is, we don't want to talk a lot about theories or um, history of this or that, but we want to talk about how we get him to tie his shoes. Uh, that's really the focus and what do we need to do today and what do we need to do next week in order to accomplish that. And all that is just to say that we want the discussion to be problem centered. Um, some additional evidence-based strategies for this uh, pro um, process of teaching adults, again, include acknowledging the parent's life experience and prior knowledge explicitly by saying so. Wow, you've had a lot of experience in um, teaching people how to cook. I bet that's going to be really valuable as we work with your child. Just as we do with young children, we want to use scaffolding. So we want to introduce resources and skills that the learners are likely to already know and build on those. So that's all what we would think of as operating within their zone of proximal development. Let's start with something they can do. And then with our help, what can they do that's a little bit more complex, a little bit more suited to the child's needs? We want to progress by teaching them how to use these resources in new activities. So maybe we teach them a strategy like expectant waiting, and we might teach them to do it uh, with their child when they're feeding the child some raisins from a box and they're giving them one at a time. But then we want to talk with them how, about how they can generalize that same strategy to lots of other situations. Can you think about how you might use this at bath time? Can you think about how you might use this when the child's playing outside? So those kinds of generalization um, steps need to be taken as we're working with adults. And we want to highlight their past successful experiences. So we want to say, remember when you first started this and, and expectant waiting was so hard and you, you just wanted to give them the raisin right away? Now you don't think it's so hard. You can wait. So let's think about how we can stretch that a little bit farther. So scaffolding, working within the zone of proximal development is very important. And finally, collaborating. We always want to give the impression that we're doing this together. We want to exchange experiences and perspectives rather than just telling the person our experience or perspective. We want to hear from them and we want to incorporate it. It's also great if you can provide any peer-to-peer -peer opportunities. It's hard to do that nowadays when we can't have groups of parents, but maybe one of the things you can do within your practice is to arrange a conference call among parents of students with similar needs and let them talk to each other with your moderation. Um, but those kinds of peer-to-peer -peer experiences are very helpful for uh, allowing parents to internalize the um, information we're trying to teach them. Um, finally, I, I want to talk a little bit about carrying all of this out at a distance. Um, so there's a, a little bit of literature that I was able to find that tells us that doing this through telepractice or through um, online conferencing can work. Um, one study uh, was done by Bayerov and Reiser who showed that um, uh, if they alternated direct service with parent delivered, telehealth health services uh, each doing each service once a week. So once a week, the clinician came to the house. The second time of the week, they did a, a telehealth visit. And when they did that, they found that they were effective in changing behaviors of students with autism. Um, another study by Vismara and all found that video conferencing combined with online instruction to support parents and improve child behaviors was also effective. So even if you don't come to the house at all, but you do all of your counseling and coaching over video conferencing, you still can affect changes in your client's behavior if the parents are carefully guided. Um, looking at uh, children who are more Towards school age, a study by Reese et al. found that parent training led to improvement in certain specific skills, child book reading, parent-child conversation, and parent-child writing. Um, and um, these skills did carry over to instances when the clinician was not present. So kind of uh, 
Oh, I'm sorry, there was one more study. That was the Lang study, which was a systematic review, and they were able to uh, identify some effective practices for remote coaching. And the practices that they found to be effective included verbal instruction and or instruction manuals. So basically telling people what to do and then following it up with a written or video version. In vivo practice was very important. So if we're talking again about uh, expectant waiting, you want to tell the parent what it is, demonstrate it, and then have the parents try it under your uh, guidance. And you can make suggestions, always being sure to validate what the parent does and then suggesting further um, enhancements. Um, role playing also worked uh, for uh, remote training, having the child, the parent take the role of the child for a while or the clinician take the role of the child and modeling by the trainer, which then the parent would imitate with the child uh, over the remote session. Reviewing videos of intervention sessions was also found to be effective. S summary, um, what we can say about parent training is that um, collateral behaviors such as maladaptive behaviors or joint attention or imitation, some very specific behaviors do seem to respond to parent-delivered intervention, both in person and remotely, at least in children with autism. But more general communicative behaviors, such as expressive language and preliteracy, are somewhat less responsive to this kind of intervention. So there's less evidence for increasing general language and literacy in children with language impairments using parent training and remote um, coaching. But for non-autistic, more general language and intellectual delays, a focus on specific skills like parent-child book reading, parent-child conversations, and parent-child writing seem to be amenable to both parent coaching and remote training. And for all children, um, it, it seems to be the case that teaching a specific skill rather than more general stimulation uh, seems to be more effective when doing coaching, particularly in a remote format. Uh, so that's all I had to say for now. Um, I did want to recommend some supports for parents or resources. We've already talked about our book, um, Navigating Social Communicative Supports for Young Children with Autism. Uh, another very good book is uh, Mark Batshaw's When Your Child Has a Disability, um, The Parent-to-Parent -parent Handbook by Santelli and Loving Lindsay by Atwell are also good sources for parents to um, connect with other parents who have had the experience of raising a child with a disability. There's, of course, lots of other media available. So uh, as I said, my co-author on the book and I have a podcast uh, for parents of children with disabilities that's available on um, iTunes and Spotify. Uh, there's another podcast called Parenting Special Needs. Um, there are several blogs that I've listed. Friendship Circle is a particularly good one, as well as websites for parents, such as Parent Center Hub, the Council for Exceptional Education, and Family Voices is a particularly good one that is really completely peer mediated. There's no professionals involved. It's all families talking about their own experiences with children with disabilities. And then um, eParent is an excellent magazine that used to be called Exceptional Parent, I, and it's not in print anymore, but it is still online as a zine, uh, www.eparent.com, a, a good source for support for your parents. So again, I want to thank you for being here, and I will certainly be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Dr. Paul. Yes? Uh, thank you for a great presentation. We are getting a lot of questions, so I'm going to go ahead and just jump right in. Um, everyone, feel free to continue adding your questions as we get started. So someone has asked, how can we incorporate counseling and training when we do not have direct contact with families? Do you have any recommendations of how we can provide person-centered, solution-focused support when direct conversation is not always feasible? Uh, I think some ways you might do it is is through uh, exchanged uh, writing. Uh, so sending home a newsletter or even making a little journal to send home to the cl client's family that you write something in and they write something back. Um, and then if they do have questions, you can apply these strategies to your response to their question. Um, I'm sure there are ways to do this online. Uh, I guess you could do it through email. I'm trying to think. Uh, um, 
I, I, I'm not real tech savvy, but I'm fairly sure that it would be easy enough to set up some sort of central repository where parents could send you questions and you could respond to the whole group. I guess maybe like a Facebook group, although maybe not Facebook, but something that your school system might provide you with um, cloud space for, but something along those lines. Um, and again, the clinician probably has to initiate this because uh, parents won't necessarily initiate it on their own. But once you open the channel of, of communication, I think you'll find that parents will respond. Great, thank you for that response. Um, another question we've received is, is it okay if a session sometimes ends up being more counseling than therapy at times? Um, there's situations where parents might be sharing a lot about their child and their concerns. Certainly that's gonna happen once in a while, but I think we do have an obligation to kind of balance counseling and, and uh, therapy. So uh, if you find, you know, if you find you spend a whole session counseling a parent, that's fine, but make sure that the next session you set aside uh, a, a relatively limited amount of time for counseling and more for direct coaching or um, intervention. You might do this by suggesting to the parent, um, I'd like you to observe me during this first part of the session today. And then we, uh, the last 10 minutes, we'll talk about your questions and your responses, that sort of thing, just to try to put some boundaries on um, their use of the time that you have with them. Uh, so once in a while, a whole session is fine, but we don't want that to be every session. So we need to think about how we can compartmentalize the counseling aspect. Thank you for that response. Um, another question we've received is, um, do you have any recommendations for practicing active listening and conversations with students who might use assisted technology devices? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, particularly if you are using um, uh, aided communication, uh, where you're both talking and using the, the device, I would say uh, you might want to repeat what the, the student uh, expressed to, to check on your correct comprehension of what they said. So if the student uh, expresses a message like, uh, I want to go outside, you might say, oh, you want to go outside. That sounds like fun, but you know, it's raining today. Uh, tell me about what you want to do outside so that you uh, let the student know you understood, but you might not be able to comply with the request. I'm not sure that answers your question. But clearly we always want, it, it's actually more important for students who use AAC because very often we might misunderstand them. It's, or they might make a mistake in expressing their uh, message and it might not convey what they really mean. So I think active listening is especially important in that context and we want to check by repeating what we think the student said and then having them confirm. That's a really good point. Thank you, Dr. Paul. Um, in the interest of time, I think we have time for one more question today, um, and then we'll go ahead and wrap up. Um, do you have any I'm sorry. Do you have any strategies regarding children who haven't been diagnosed yet but are on the spectrum? Will these resources work for the parents of those children as well? Well, I, I think they would generally, but um, you want to be careful because if the child hasn't been diagnosed and you're all of a sudden giving the parent a whole bunch of material about kids with autism, they might start to become anxious or uh, feel that um, they're not on the same wavelength as you are. So um, I think I would start with more general resources, something like the, the eParent magazine uh, that or, or our podcast, which deals with kids with all kinds of disabilities, not just autism, uh, or a book like the Batshaw book that kind of is a little bit more general that they could look at for answers to some of their questions. And then they may come back to you later once a diagnosis is given, or as you move through the diagnostic process, you might say something like, well, we haven't heard yet what the final diagnostic decision is, but I could give you some information on autism if you're curious, and then you could see what that diagnosis might mean for your child. You know, you want to just tread lightly when a parent has not yet assimilated uh, a child's diagnosis. 
That's a great response. Thank you very much, Dr. Paul. Um, in the interest of time, I do think we're going to end the Q&A portion of today's webinar, but we can follow up with people separately outside the webinar for those questions that we didn't get to today. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and quickly um, take back our controls so we can finish up today's presentation. Okay, so um, so thank you everybody for attending today. Um, I just want to quickly go over um, a brief special offer that we have. So I want to remind everybody that um, for those of you who are looking for additional resources, please look for Dr. Paul's book with her colleague and co-author, Dr. Dania Fahim. Let's talk navigating communication services and supports for your young child with autism, as well as their podcast that's been mentioned a few times um, during today's presentation. I also want to share a special offer from Brooks Publishing. So we are offering a 20% discount on all of our products through the end of June. So anyone who watches today's webinar or the recording can use the code COFFEETALK at checkout to receive this discount. Um, there are a few exclusions, but most of the products on our website are applicable, including Dr. Paul's book. So please feel free to take advantage of that. And um, if you are looking for additional resources over the coming weeks, be sure to visit Brooks Publishing's website for our latest additions to our Coffee Chat series. Um, we have more webinars every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, so feel free to bookmark that page and tune in regularly for more webinars similar to this one. Um, and then one last thing that I'd like to share on the Brooks Publishing website, we do have um, additional resources surrounding COVID-19. So we have recommended reading, um, downloadable resources, as well as professional development webinars. So you can access all of those resources using the URL listed on the slide. So um, thank you so much for everyone who attended today's webinar. And thank you very much again to Dr. Paul for a great presentation. And thank you all for coming. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you.